Okay, I think we can begin. Um, we were working on the German case. Guten Morgen, meine Damen und Herren. Uh, we have been working on the German case. Um, and we shall be continuing with it. Um, last time we started off with a discussion on um, German lands in historical perspective. So, so milestones, state tradition. So this morning, my plan is to continue with it, complete that discussion, and, and jump onto a political economy of economic and social policies. So once again, the plan is intact as usual. We'll continue with state tradition, um, state in history. Um, then we'll start talking about political economy, Governance and policy making, participation and interest representation, um, and then followed by um, some, some discussion on uh, current debates. Um, we were working on um, the Third Reich, um, and then the Weimar Republic, Hitler coming to power, um, having um, having conquered much of Europe, had attacked <coughs> excuse me, the USSR, and then, ladies and gentlemen, and then, um, and then concentration camps, well, extermination camps, Holocaust, um, this was um, this was a phenomenal event in history, uh, or series of events. Um, in Germany, more than six million Jews, um, Roma, and homosexuals were persecuted. Um, the unwanted had been evaporated, um, whose lives had been seen as worthless. Um, and exploitation in the concentration camps translated into extermination in the extermination camps. And this was through a systematic and bureaucratic apparatus of the state. Um, so this is the definition of genocide. Um, so in the early stages, everything began with racist attacks, um, anti-Semitic propaganda, um, then taking away of rights of Jews, uh, not only rights, but also property. Um, then Jews were being confined to ghettos, especially in large cities. And, um, and then millions were bystanders. Millions watched things roll out. Uh, but the point here I want to I wanna remind you is that all state institutions were involved, um, that this was carried out through the apparatus of all apparatuses of the state, um, directly or indirectly. So military, um, industry, including private industry, banks, science, medicine, um, they all cooperated against um, the unwanted. So, uh, so this, was, um, this was a shock in world history. Um, anyway, so, um, so this is where we had left off, and we're fast forwarding. Uh, this is the map. You'll, you'll remember where um, Hitler went into parts of USSR, much of Europe, almost all of Europe, except for um, uh, Sweden up north, Spain and Portugal down south. Um, Turkey was, was the buffer there. Um, and, um, and this is the devastation. The Reichstag of 1945, Frankfurter Alle 1945, um, the Brandenburg Gate, um, 1945, you see cars toppled. Uh, this is what it looks like in the contemporary period. Um, this is the Unter den Linden, basically. Um, I think it's, it's from that side. Um, 
onto the Linden, the, the main avenue um, in Berlin. Um, what it looked like back in 1945, that's 1990s for you. Uh, these were the pictures that, that looked alike, so I, I brought them with me here. Um, all bombarded, all plastered. Um, this is the Berlin Cathedral, 45, and now 97. But I think that building was also under renovation. I think that the new, uh, I should bring a new photo because I think this building no longer exists, um, the, the modern building. Um, so fast forwarding everything to 1990s. Um, but before then, we see German lands under occupation in that um, for about four to five years, we have West Germany, uh, the Federal Republic of Germany, um, under, um, under allied control, Bundesrepublik Deutschland. And the other part is the GDR, uh, the Deutsche Demokratische Republik, um, German Democratic Republic under Soviet control. So, so uh, occupation, Germany divided into two um, for a period. Then from 1949, 1950s onwards, we see in the early period, right after occupation, um, <clears throat> we, we have emergence of two units neither of which are, were fully sovereign. So, so they were under, um, under some kind of um, power uh, or some kind of block or some kind of influence from, from either of the sides. So under, under Cold War conditions, heavy, hefty Cold War conditions. The, the Federal Republic um, saw increasing levels of political stability in time. So, um, and political stability brought with it democracy. So the West got democratized in time, um, full-fledged democracy, um, rapid economic growth through um, what's called regulated market economy. We'll talk about um, details later on. Um, but, but we see a, the Western part growing, um, democracy consolidating, political stability sustained, and we see um, high levels of uh, welfare for citizens. And we have a large, comprehensive welfare state. So the German miracle built also side by side with, with, the, uh, with the economic miracle, uh, there was a welfare state, very comprehensive welfare state, which had its origins back in Bismarckian times, late 19th century. But this was the time when the German welfare state was consolidated, when the, when the German welfare state was, uh, became a comprehensive, uh, protective um, apparatus, um, protecting citizens against risks in the labor market. Um, <clears throat> and the idea, remember, I showed you the map of you know, 1500s, Holy Roman Empire, then Prussia. The, ideas of, the idea of um, principalities, kingdoms, city-states are now the German Länder, the land, the provinces, the state level. So, so we have strong regional governments within a, a, a federal unit. In the, in the West. In the East, this was um, the DDR, the GDR, uh, was controlled by the Socialist Unity Party, um, Communist Stalinist Party, um, very high levels of educational attainment, uh, another type of welfare state, so um, humongous, you know, very serious social protection, full employment, um, we all thought when I was growing up, when we were all growing up, the, the, the East <clears throat> was also uh, endowed with high levels of technology. But um, when you know, 1990s came, we realized that this wasn't the case. Um, so, so anyway, um, it, the economy was not as vibrant. It was more or less a command economy. 
under uh, Soviet type of planning. Um, then comes after 1990, but, but this is, um, I'm sorry, this is what the East and the West looks like. Um, 11 lander here, five lander here, um, and this is going to be united um, back in 1990. We celebrated the 25th anniversary um, back in November last year. Uh, in, in 20 of 2015. So um, one doesn't realize how much, I mean, how fast time, time passes. So um, <clears throat> reunification and after, immediate aftermath of reunification. This was a rapid process. Uh, summer of 1990, there was a currency reform. The East decided to adopt the Western Deutsche Mark. Uh, so with the, um, with the currency adoption by the GDR of the day mark, German mark, Deutsche Mark, um, there was much change. I mean, there was, I mean, there had been some change in the East, um, that there was, um, there was some, um, some discontent. Uh, there was also, um, some misgivings against the regime, much resentment against the Eastern regime. Uh, so, so all of this came into, um, or all of this crystallized into a massive movement. Um, so, so migration, westbound migration, um, then a referendum <clears throat> on whether to, to, to reunify or not. And the referendum um, produced Yes, let's reunite. Um, and this resulted in, <coughs> excuse me, the incorporation of five Eastern lander into the, the 11 Western lander. So, so we have the Federal Republic of Germany. So this is a case of, uh, in a way, an annexation of the East. This is your East to the West. Okay, so, so the Federal Republic of Germany enlarged that is to say, uh, through this unification or reunification process uh, 26 years ago around these days. Um, but this has brought with it all kinds of costs to or on the part of the Western, well, before what used to be the Western, but now the Federal Republic of Germany or German government. Um, the um, the chancellor of the time, Helmut Kohl, um, 1990s, he and his cabinet in a way miscalculated the costs. Uh, as I just said, we were really thought, thinking that the communist economy was strong, but um, everybody realized that it wasn't as strong as, as expected or as one would be thinking of. Uh, and technology was not as, not as advanced as, as we were thinking. Um, please. What are the reasons uh, Vespa's failure to ease? Uh, well, one explanation. One explanation is that, of course, um, that, that this was a command economy. Markets were not functioning. Uh, democracy was not the rule. Um, and that um, this was more or less a repressive regime. And in the East, there was massive economic growth. Um, political democracy had been there from almost day one. Um, elections were continuing uh, in, in an uninterrupted way. Um, so, so this was a booming economy um, and in the West. In the West. And, and the West was, um, the East had also seen um, some economic boom. But it was, um, it was managed through centralized planning. Um, political rights were curtailed, whereas in the, in the East, uh, in the West, I'm sorry, uh, you had political democracy ha going hand in hand with, um, with markets. So, so the West prospered. The East remained somewhat backward. Um, and it was also controlled by um, by the Soviet Union, the USSR of the time. 
So um, it was, in a way, I mean, kind of a satellite state under the Soviet bloc, um, ruled by the party, um, the Communist Party. So, um, so, so that, that, that is one explanation. Um, there are other explanations. One is a more historical one. The east of the Elbe River um, had always been backward. The west of the Elbe River uh, had always been much more um, open and uh, open to ports. Market activity was much uh, higher, much, much larger, much more intensive. So there, are, there were historical roots or historical, yeah, historical reasons why the east was backward and the west um, had been more developed. So industrialization came much later to the east. Industrialization had always been part and parcel of the Western life. Um, we also had um, city-states, um, trading states, in the northern part of Germany. Um, Hamburg, um, Bremen, um, so these were lively areas that made up in the, in the, in the um, medieval times that made up what was called the Hanseatic League, uh, Hansa. So, so the, the Hansa area, um, we had in the medieval times two um, vibrant areas. Up north is the Hansa, uh, the Hanseatic League of city-states, trading states, uh, with ports. And we had Lombardia in the south, you know, northern Italy. So, so as you can see, the difference between southern Italy versus northern Italy, um, and also um, northwest Germany and southeast Germany. So, so you, you, there are more historical reasons as to how or, and why uh, the west and the east had been decoupled in terms of political as well as economic development. So um, strains on the budget, on the Western budget, with the reunification, backward technology, unemployment jumped to 20% in the Eastern Lander. 20% um, unemployment from about 2 to 3% unemployment. So, so imagine the shock to, um, to the Eastern Germans. And imagine the burden, excuse me, on the, on, the, on the Western Germans, um, Western system. Um, costs had been rising. Um, unemployment benefits had to be provided to the Eastern Germans. Um, the Eastern Germans had, had also been migrating to the West. Uh, and many had seen that, that they were getting the jobs of, um, of the Westerners. So, so because, because they were pleased to work. Uh, some of them were pleased to work at a lower, lower wage than the Western Germans. So, so massive economic costs of uh, reunification, uh, adjustment to the process of, um, um, you know, to the, to the, what's the term here? It's like very abrupt change. Okay, so, so this was, and, and um, this was, this wasn't done gradually. This was done very abruptly, and that there was not much time for adaptation. And then uh, rebuilding costs also um, were very important in the East. Um, technology had to be brought to the East. The state apparatus had to be rebuilt in the East. Infrastructure had to be <clears throat> rebuilt in the East. Um, schools, hospitals, all kinds of services um, had to be um, brought together into the Western type system. This meant that there were huge costs on the budget. So early 1990s, and this was a time when Europe was going through a recession, um, which had some of its part because of this reunification process. Um, and the Kohl government said, fellow German citizens, uh, in order to absorb all this, <clears throat> in order to help adapt our system, we need to raise taxes. 
So there was, um, for a moment, a, a, what's called a unification tax, which was 7.5% on, on personal incomes. So, um, so more taxes, um, all of this change um, was not quite popular, which brought the end of conservative governments under Helmut Kohl, and that there was a new coalition uh, in the second half of 1990s, a red-green coalition now, um, um, headed by SPD, Social Democratic Party, and the Greens. Um, and the, the chancellor was um, Gerhard Schröder. So, um, so this is what I wanted to discuss uh, in terms of state tradition in historical perspective. Um, the milestones, political milestones in German history. Now I'd like to continue with um, political economy. <clears throat> the German political economy is an example of a coordinated market economy. Remember we talked about different varieties of capitalism that there was um, liberal market economies exemplified by um, Britain and also the US and coordinated market economies exemplified by Germany. So, so this is one example of a coordinated market economy, networked capitalism. Uh, cooperative network of small and large businesses um, coming together and um, you have vested interests of different types of firms in different industries, vested interests in one another. Okay, so you have a bank, attached to it is an industrial firm. Um, if, do we have a pen here? So imagine we have This is your industrial firm, let's say a glass factory. Okay, and this is your bank. Uh, the Daymark, what's now the Euro. Um, so, so these different firms had been coordinated in the sense that the, um, the, chief, the, the, the executives here are sitting in the boards of the executive boards of the bank. And their executives are also sitting in their boards. Okay, so, so this was known as the bank-centric model of economic development. And also another uh, way to describe this is, the, is coordinated capitalism, in which you had different worms different firms cooperating uh, as if they were a part of a large network. Um, and, and these are local regional banks in, in most of the cities. If you've ever been to Germany, you always see Sparkasse, Köln, Sparkasse, Bremen. These are the, uh, these are the, um, the savings banks of Köln, uh, Cologne, savings banks of Bremen. Um, so, so small, for, um, small banks, regional, local banks, uh, working hand in hand with domestic, well, actually regional, um, local industries, and each have, each has, a vested interest in the life of the other unit. So, so they're they're carefully coordinated um, and carefully monitored. Um, so, and, and we, we call this um, bank-centric model of economic development. When you look at the um, second half of 20th century, you see German economic miracle also being facilitated through this system. This is also another example of, as we shall be talking about later, um, as opposed to shareholder capitalism, this is an example of stakeholder capitalism, okay, that, that each, um, firm has a stake in the life of the other, and this firm has a stake 
in the life of the other. Um, so, so this is more of a historical, you know, the, the German model um, in a nutshell. Pre-World War II, before 1870s, we had regional economic growth, um, trading cities up north, um, medieval times. Um, but all of this economic growth um, were translated into a major success with the Zollverein first, early 19th century, and the unification process in, in Germany. So, so massive economic growth, um, early industrialization all throughout 19th century. And by the end of 19th century, we had Germany emerging as the super industrial power of the time. So 1900 manufacturing outputs, Germany was unmatched. And um, in this period, in the 20th century, I'm, I'm sorry, in the, in the 19th century, the Zollverein facilitated all this. The customs union facilitated all this. Um, 1870s, remember we talked about um, Otto von Bismarck's um, re, uh, like unification of Germany uh, through um, the hands of the elite, um, landed aristocracy, Junkers on the one hand, and the bourgeoisie, industrial bourgeoisie. And this was sometimes referred to as the marriage of Iron and Rye. Rye represents um, Junkers, landed aristocracy, um, and Iron represents the rising industrial bourgeoisie of the time. So um, when, and, and each one needed the other. So, so that's why we refer to it as the marriage. So, so there was a symbiotic relationship between uh, the landed aristocracy as well as the, um, the, the industrial bourgeoisie, uh, rising bourgeoisie. And Bismarck himself started using uh, railroad development to unify these interests, to mediate these interests. Because in order to build railroads, you need, you need support, right? And you need coal and iron. Um, you get those from the Junkers, and once the railroad, railroads start operating, um, the Junkers will also be transporting their products from their farmlands to, um, to the harbors uh, and be, be able to, to, to export their, their produce in, in world markets. Uh, state is quite active um, in the economy which was facilitated by coordination between government, business, and banking. Um, banking and business, um, this was the, the, um, the model. And, and also, we shall be talking about neo-corporatism. So the state's role is, is crucial here. The state, in a way, mediates interests. Um, when we talk about the Sozialmarktwirtschaft, the social market economy, we'll, we'll talk about more, more about this. But, but what I want to emphasize here is that there is a tradition, even before World War II, even in the 19th century, that there is state, the state trying to mediate interests, not only marrying iron and rye, but also trying to mediate interests of capital and labor. So, so um, policy making, interest in intermediation had always been part and parcel of the German story. 1918, uh, war reparations. Um, 1923, hyperinflation. The, the gold marks have been used in the stove. Um, the Third Reich emerges with Hitler, uh, represses workers, um, slave labor, um, produce military armaments. Those of you who've seen Schindler's List, uh, the movie, which, is, which was, um, it was a very interesting movie. Um, and, and you still see some German large, like large firms, industrial firms, being brought to the court, um, even, even in the contemporary period. Uh, Krupp, for example, was brought to the court um, for having a hand in 
this extermination process, um, which is now part of Thyssen Group, um, the company, which builds escalators, elevators, which we also have in this country. Uh, we probably have some at Bilkent too. Um, so so <clears throat> this is the 19th century, um, post-World War II. Now let me emphasize that this is another model. Remember in when we talk about the US model and the British model, we generally refer to laissez-faire, right? In the French model, <clears throat> excuse me, we generally refer to model of economic policy making as French model of economic policy making as in history. I hear dirigism, very good. Here we see um, the social market economy. Okay? Um, social market wirtschaft, social market economy. Let's me, let me, <clears throat> excuse me, talk to you about uh, economic policy side of the economic side, the market side of the social market economy. Um, this is a model, um, so what kind of market is this? It's a market of, it's, it's a regulated market, it's a combination of efficient competitive markets, competitive economy, alongside a generous comprehensive welfare state. This is why it's called the social market economy, okay? So, so um, generous, comprehensive welfare state alongside a competitive, dynamic market, dynamic economy. And policies, so what kind of policies are we talking about? This is very much unlike the Anglo-American laissez-faire system, but it's also unlike the, the French dirigism, etatism system. Uh, we have some, um, we have state intervention, which is indirect, uh, which is only supportive. So we do not have over-regulation. So remember we talked about iron triangles in the US case. This results, this may result in regulatory capture. This also um, means that the US economy, that there are many exceptions to the rule of laissez-faire, that there was a series of regulation. This, in this system, we have the, the state intervening in a much less direct way. So there is no massive regulation behind supporting the markets. So no over-regulation. Um, it's a more of a flexible system. Um, the state provides framework legislations, or I'm sorry, framework regulations, which in a way set the rules of the game. So it prepares conducive ground for firms to flourish. Um, unlike the US case, um, where we have, um, in the second half of 19, uh, 20th century, um, the, for example, the Federal Aeronautics Board um, and um, the federal authorities regulating airlines um, restricted the size of sandwiches provided uh, in order to, you know, um, in order to provide a competitive, fully functioning, competitive uh, economy. So prices were regulated. There were price ceilings on on airfares. Uh, we didn't. We never had this in, in Germany, or much less so um, in comparison to what was happening uh, across the Atlantic. Um, we have a smaller amount of smaller size of nationalized industry, and we have um, cooperative federalism in the sense that we have a powerful land government, state government, and there is much delegation of power to the land, uh, the land level. Um, so in that respect, there is, um, there is much um, delegation to the land level. Uh, and in that, it is in this context that we can 
speak of a flexible type of regulation. Um, Bank-centric model, which is an example of stakeholder capitalism, that we have a bank, a local regional bank, attached to um, a local regional industry. And, and we have, um, you know, each, we have each having a vested interest in the life and therefore profits of the other, um, other firm. Um, we have in Germany um, what's called the socially responsible capitalism. And socially responsible capitalism means that we have a high wage, high productivity, and high welfare um, economy. But despite high wage, and because of high productivity, and also because of high welfare, we have a competitive economy. Uh, the Germans would like to see their, their system as you know, socially responsible capitalism. Um, we have high skills or skill development. Um, we have works councils. And we have R&D strategies, all you know, coordinated by, at the firm level, but, but also facilitated by the state. Um, high skills means um, that the education and training system um, had been there. The, the German word Meister, uh, masters, um, you, know, in, you know, tradesmen, craftsmen, uh, had always been there, you know, in, in, especially in the era of proto-industrialization, early industrialization, this was very important. Apprenticeship system had always been very important. Uh, apprentices working with um, the Meister. So vocational training systems uh, had been very important um, in Germany historically. So skill development was, is, or has been one of the most important goals in this, in this economy. Uh, we also have uh, very competitive um, industries. The German cars, um, car industry, automotive industry, chemicals, um, um, machine tools, industrial um, electronics, and, and all that, of course, are, are all hallmarks of the German competitive um, markets, competitive industries. Uh, Works Councils is another institution which has been a central part of the socially responsible capitalism. Um, these are firm level institutions elected, whose members are elected by workers, by those firms, or, or, or in those firms, to voice their interests. So, so Works Councils are important institutions organized at the, at the industry level, at, at the firm level, I'm sorry. We have, um, we have workers um, coming together, elected by other workers, representing all interests of these workers to the management of the workers. So, so. Yeah, there's a kind of in a way, in a way, in a way, this is a firm level Union. In a way, this is a firm level union, or, at the, or a union organized at the firm level. Uh, very autonomous, but of course accountable to the workers. Okay? So, so there is, there is uh, negotiation, uh, there is consultation, there is collaboration, there is cooperation at the level of the firm. Uh, between management and capital, um, I'm sorry, between management and um, and employees, uh, labor and capital. So, so these are not unions, but in a way, a coordination mechanism within um, within the firm, and they also implement vocational training programs. They also help implement vocational training intra firm, uh, within the firm, vocational training programs. Uh, they also help um, um, train apprentices in that particular firm. So, so they help 
coordinate some of the firm's activities. So they're, they're multifunction uh, units. And R&D, um, research and development. What's research? What's development? We may have talked about this. Where do you do research? What's research? What's development? What's development? We know what research is. We have an idea about what research is. What's development? Any ideas? There is research. That's a Turkish word for it. Research and development. But it has something to do with technology. You do research. Then what's development? We hear research. We hear about research. Huh. Okay. Okay. So, so you modify something and you make some some other product or a service. Uh, research is what we do at universities, at in labs, in private or public labs, right? We know we have an idea about what research is. It has something to do with science. Uh, has something to do with observations, and um, and we also, uh, you know, this is the science behind it. This is the research behind it. When we, um, when we develop it, that research, we have a marketable product for sale in the market. So this is the product of research first, then development, because it's sold in the market. OK, so it's a developed product. Uh, you, you, you develop a service or a good, a product, to be able to be exchanged in the market. So, so um, the German system also is known for its emphasis on R&D, adapting to, um, to new technologies, refine um, competitive sectors, which uh, result in um, high levels of competitiveness worldwide. Um, and one last element of the economic policy aspect of uh, the German model is the Bundesbank. Um, the Bundesbank, with the memory of hyperinflation back in tw uh, 1920s, 1922, um, had always been very cautious about um, the specter of inflation. Uh, had always been very cautious about uh, any rise in inflation, very sensitive to um, the chief economic evil in its uh, from where it stands, inflation. So, so price stability had always been a very important goal of the German central bank. Um, yes, fiscal policy had been expansionary, but monetary policy had been quite, um, quite tight when you look at the 20th century, when you look at the second half of 20th century. Uh, because of the... Um, because of the memories of 1920s. Uh, remember, we talked about hyperinflation uh, and that the worry of inflation again. So, so there is, there is um, many never agains in this country. So inflation, never again. War, never again. OK, so, so, so these have been, and, and especially uh, for, for many Germans, um, it was in a way infused in the culture that it was this, this inflationary period which really produced um, Hitler. So, so, so in order to avoid this, never again. So we don't, we, there is, there's much aversion towards inflation. And because inflation is associated with all kinds of ills. One is fascism, another is you know, total war, uh, total destruction. So, so inflation, um, an aversion to inflation, and a, um, an emphasis on um, what's called stability culture, an emphasis on price stability, an emphasis on sound money an emphasis on stable finances. 
okay, which, which in a way um, facilitated the German economic miracle in the post-World War II period. Please. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. First World War? Yeah, about the mm -hmm. Because we saw the end of the plenty of the Treaty of uh, Versailles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I they paid some some yeah. a hefty part of it. They started paying, but then Hitler came and said, I'm not paying all that. Uh, the central bank, the Bundesbank, um, before World War II and Bundesbank after World War II, you have, you have two different logics. Um, well, the Bundesbank was, was founded after World War II. Uh, the central bank of the period um, really could not resist um, the political events. So, so in that period, 1920s, after World War II, I'm sorry, World War I, Treaty of Versailles, the government felt that it needed to print money in order to repay the reparations, the war reparations, the compensations, the, the hu humongous debt, which was you know, twice the size of German GDP. So what can you do? You had to print money. You had to pay them to uh, the Western powers, the Allied powers. And then um, at home, what does? A gold mark mean it just means nothing. Um, it just basically meant that this was the value of the gold mark had been, you know, um, had been plastered really. So, 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 um, so, the the psyche of bankers at the Bundesbank, the stability culture, um, never again. No, we, we, do, we, we detest inflation. We do not want to see inflation. So price stability, um, stable finances, sound money had always been very important in the eyes of central bankers. So, so which, which really facilitated a period of massive economic growth with very low levels of inflation, even after the world economic crisis of 1970s. So, so e even when we had um, rampant inflation worldwide, we did not, we did not have much inflation um, in Germany, <coughs> excuse me, in the 1970s, also in the 1980s. Uh, so, so very low inflation. Um, and by doing this, the state prepared, in a way, a conducive ground for, econo for the economic miracle to happen. Um, I think I should stop here um, and then discuss the social policy aspects of the Sozial um, Marktwirtschaft next time. Any other questions? No. Okay.